I don't know about anyone else, but I see Barry Weiss as a free speech advocate. Strike up another one for the uncancelable. Greetings, and welcome back to Here's What I Heard. I'm Laura Degatis, your hostess. Thank you for clicking on my little acre of the internet today. No, she's not marching or fundraising or anything like that. But you gotta admire the fact that she gave up a very prestigious and possibly very lucrative career to actually lead by example. I've heard Barry Weiss's name on and off since Trump has been in office. She's not earth-shatteringly relevant news at any time, but she does occasionally get the attention of the two main sides of the infotainment industry. What, you think what all these folks do, including myself, is news? Barry Weiss authored the book How to Fight Anti-Semitism, which won awards, during which time she was an opinionist, yes, I just made that up, and editor of the New York Times. Before that, she was an op-ed and book review editor at the Wall Street Journal and senior editor at Tablet Magazine. Sorry, I didn't look up which one that was. While she was working at the Times, Vanity Fair even dubbed her the Times' star opinion writer and took a wild picture of her. Have you ever seen a gust of wind blow your cardigan back but not your dress against your legs? Strange photo indeed. Now it seems that as she went indie, as a former legacy journalist, the legacy journalists now are trying yet again to at least shame her, if not entice others to cancel her. But before I get into all of that... I'm going live, coming up December the 2nd, 7 p.m. Central. I'm calling the series Talk to Me America. My call-in talk show will feature you. Call in and tell the universe how you feel about the topics that affect us the most. Let us know what your experience was when things we see happening have happened to you. We cannot be free without the freedom of speech, and I want to be a part of that freedom that we are guaranteed by our Creator. So stay tuned and get your voices ready to speak out. Spread the news and stay tuned for Here's what I heard's Talk To Me America series, coming up December the 2nd, 7 p.m. Central. In the meantime, please give us a like, a share, a subscribe, and a comment. You will be doing this on my call-in talk show, so start letting me know what you heard now in the comments. The best comments and the best phone calls will be featured in my videos all over the internet. The world wants to hear what you have to say, so call me and tell them like it is. A donation would be the ultimate and will help me get your voice out on as many platforms as possible. And you can follow me on those other platforms too. All of my links are below. Click on some of them, will ya? Barry Weiss is a former New York Times journalist, journalist who quit because of the censorship and then intimidation she was experiencing there. It seems that they would not let her write about certain things that the legacy media doesn't want anyone to be talking about. And when she complained, she would get bashed and ridiculed secretly by her peers, and some of them would even try to cancel her and get her fired. I'm pretty sure that everyone has seen this, or if you haven't, here is just a little taste of Barry handing Brian Stelter... Brian Stelter? His ass about the topic of actual journalism and factual reporting. You write, there are tens of millions of Americans who aren't on the hard left or the hard right who feel the world has gone mad. So in what ways has the world gone mad? Well, you know, when you have the chief reporter on the beat of COVID for the New York Times talking about how questioning or pursuing the question of the lab leak is racist, the world has gone mad when you're not able to say out loud and in public that there are differences between men and women the world has gone mad when we're not allowed to acknowledge that rioting is rioting and it is bad and that silence is not violence but violence is violence the world has gone mad when we're not able to say that hunter biden's laptop is a story worth pursuing the world has gone mad 
when in the name of progress, young school children, as young as kindergarten, are being separated in public schools because of their race. And that is called progress rather than segregation. The world has gone mad. Well, who's the people stopping the conversation? Who are they? Um, people that work at networks, <laughs> frankly, like the one I'm speaking on right now. What's going on is the transformation of these sense-making institutions of American life. It's the news media, mm -hmm. it's the publishing house, it's the Hollywood studios, it's our universities, and they are narrowing in a radical way what's mm -hmm. acceptable to say and what isn't. And you and I both know there doesn't need to be an edict from the C-suite in order for people to feel that. Notice how he reads merely the first line of her about me on her blog page and then tries to bait her almost looking down his nose at her into something he can ridicule I'm willing to bet that for this interview he probably didn't actually read much farther than that first line showed on the camera in fact I don't believe that he has the wits to actually do that unless someone's written it down for him or instructed him to I think they just instructed him to do anything he could like a little petulant child to embarrass, ridicule, or get her to react badly. Well, and I mean, this man doesn't quit either. I mean, look what happened to him on C-SPAN. You defamed a child, and then you had to settle out of court to pay this child for distorting information about this young individual. Hey. This guy is a joke. Fiery, but mostly peaceful protest. Yeah, you go out there, uh, Humpty Dumpty. We all know <laughs> you're not reliable. You are nothing but a stooge. And so CNN is really the enemy of the truth, and that's my opinion. I don't need to look at that. That's not, you're, you're, This is not news to me. I just don't think they're, they're true. CNN is true anymore. And no matter what he said afterwards, nothing made him look any better. Of course, the constant ridicule of Stelter over this encounter with Barry Weiss by all of our favorite talking heads made me want to dig just a little bit deeper into Barry Weiss. Actually, it was finally when Mark Dice said something that kind of hit me funny. And not to get off on another subject, but sometimes we do get off and far into our own bubble. We kind of go off what we actually think just to justify our comments, our beliefs, or our actions with regards to our own agenda. It's human. It happens. But he actually said that you shouldn't take Barry Weiss seriously because she thinks the Bible is anti-Semitic. Immediately, I'm thinking probably just the New Testament because Jewish folks, at least the ones that I know, do not believe that the Messiah has come yet and she is either unaware that Jesus was a Jew or is merely using the jargon of today to describe her take on the fact that no Jewish person, again, that I know of, abides by anything in the New Testament. Knowing what I know about my Jewish friends, this comment and the fact that this comment kind of goes against her free speech made me actually want to do the research into the video. Uh, our side makes mistakes too. And I know, I know, boring. But I do try to be thorough. I do the boring stuff so that you don't have to. But I still suggest that you do them for yourself as well. Don't forget, I'm just a famous nobody. Anyway, to me, Barry Weiss already sounds like an avid advocate of free speech. And of course, you all know that that is my goal as well. So I'm going to read you a little bit more of her blog's About Me page, and then I'm going to read you her resignation letter from the New York Times. First, an excerpt from her About section on her blog called Common Sense with Barry Weiss. The page Stelter couldn't be bothered to read past for the first line before his interrogation of this bastion of the First Amendment. I wonder if anyone that follows him bothered to read her pages any further either. Probably not, but let's read. There are tens of millions of Americans who aren't on the hard left or the hard right who feel that the world has gone mad. 
At least it's upside down and backwards at the moment. Science is at the mercy of politics. Identity trumps ideas. In the name of progress, art is erased and history is rewritten. I think that's shameful. As an artist, could I be erased too? Obvious truths are dangerous to say out loud. This newsletter is for those people. Okay, just reading the first paragraph tells me that Stelter didn't read past the first line. His first question was, how the world is going mad in her opinion. Wow, Stelter, you're just such a journalistic genius. Not. She actually goes on in her about section to explain what she meant by the first sentence even more. I read on. It's for people who want to understand the world as it is, not the world as some wish it to be. It's for people who seek the truth rather than the comfort of a team or a tribe. It's for people who prefer to think for themselves. Curiosity about the wrong topics has become a liability in the, lega in the legacy press. But curiosity is the reason I became a journalist in the first place. It definitely wasn't the money. It depends on what kind of journalism you do and how hard you're willing to work and how famous you become. Just ask Mr. Don Lemon and the rest of those idiots on those TV shows. I'm thrilled to have the freedom to pursue this again and to have the freedom to experiment a bit more. Sometimes I'll write columns, other times I'll do interviews with interesting people. I'm also excited to recommend books, movies, recipes, and the work of people I admire. Yeah, those that probably give her a little stipend to support them. Hey, it's the way we eat. I hope reading Common Sense reassures you that you are not crazy and that you aren't alone. I'm really glad to have you here. I guess she would be, especially if you're paying. But once again, nothing wrong with that. This about page alone tells me that she's an advocate for free speech and she likes to do a variety of things in her craft. It's unfortunate that one has to pay to do so and I see that she has no problem sharing the wealth actually by recommending others' works. Of course, I am sure some sponsor her work as well. But again, we all got to eat, no matter what your opinion is. And of course, if people are willing to pay her for this, there's nothing wrong with it. Nobody says she can't take that money. Now, of course, you know, Stelter isn't her first takedown either. She gives it pretty good to her supervisory staff at New York Times when she resigns. This is also from her blog. She wanted to, sh it looks like she wanted to show everybody so that the New York Times would not twist what she did or said. Let me read this. Okay, dear AG, it is with sadness that I write to tell you that I'm resigning from the New York Times. I joined the paper with gratitude and optimism three years ago. I was hired with the goal of bringing in voices that would not otherwise appear in your pages. You know, first time writers, centrists, conservatives, and others who would not naturally think of the New York Times as their home. The reason for this effort was clear. The paper's failure to anticipate the outcome of the 2016 election meant that it didn't have a firm grasp of the country it covers. Dean Beckett and others have admitted as much on various occasions. The priority and opinion was to help redress that critical shortcoming. I was honored to be a part of the effort led by James Bennett. I'm proud of my work as a writer and as an editor. Among those, I helped bring our pages, the Venezuelan dissident Willie Ortega, the Iranian chess champion Dorsa Durkashanti, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing these, <laughs> and the Hong Kong Christian Democrat Derek Lam. Also, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Masi Alijad, Alanijad, Zaina Arafat, Elena Baker, Elna Baker, Rachel Den Hollander, Maddie Friedman, Nick Gillespie, Heather Hying, Randall Kennedy, Julius Krein, Monica Lewinsky, Glenn Lowry, 
Jesse Singal, Ali Salfon, Chloe Valderi, Thomas Chatterton Williams, Wesley Yang, and many others. I'm not sure why she would name all of those, uh, other than maybe just recognition. Since she's leaving, she wants to make sure that these people get their due. I don't know. But the lessons that ought to have followed the election, lessons about the importance of understanding other Americans, the necessity of resisting tribalism, and the centrality of the free exchange of ideas to a democratic society have not been learned. Instead, a new consensus has emerged in the press, but perhaps especially at this paper. That truth isn't a process of collective discovery, but an orthodoxy already known to an enlightened few whose job is to inform everyone else. We could probably say that about the entire infotainment industry, industry at this point, mainly because of the fact that uh, you have them saying, you're not allowed to be owning any of the WikiLeaks emails from, uh, from Hillary Clinton. Only we can tell you how about that. It's like, no, <laughs> that's not true at all. Otherwise, it wouldn't be on the internet. It wasn't against the law for anybody but them. Tell me another one. She goes on. Twitter is not the masthead of the New York Times, but Twitter has become its ultimate editor. As the ethics and mores of that platform have become those of the paper, the paper itself has increasingly become kind of performance space. Stories are chosen and told in a way to satisfy the narrowest of audiences, rather than to allow a curious public to read about the world and then draw their own conclusions. I was always taught that journalists were charged with writing the first rough draft of history. Now, history itself is one more ephemeral thing molded to fit the needs of the predetermined narrative. My own forays into wrong think have made me the subject of constant bullying by colleagues who disagree with my views. They've called me a Nazi, a racist. I have learned to brush off comments about how I'm writing about the Jews again. Several colleagues perceived to be friendly with me were badgered by coworkers. My work and my character are openly demeaned on company-wide Slack channels where masthead editors regularly weigh in. There, some coworkers insist I need to be rooted out of the, if this company is to be truly an inclusive one while others post axe emojis next to my name. Still, other New York Times employees publicly smear me as a liar and a bigot on Twitter, with no fear that harassing me will be met with appropriate action, because they never are. So the criminals are running everything, it sounds like. That's a shame. And these are the people that are always screaming and yelling, tolerance, tolerance, I'm going to beat it into you. How tolerant can that be? There are terms for all of this, unlaw unlawful discrimination, hostile work environment, and constructive discharge. I'm no legal expert, but I know that this is wrong. Yes, she actually has the ability to sue them if she could, if she can. She's got all the proof, it sounds to me like. She was harassed by, via email, including the emojis. Somebody was inciting at least violence enough against her to get her fired. They didn't do that, though. I do not understand how you all have allowed this kind of behavior to go on inside your company in full view of the paper's entire staff and the public. And I certainly can't square how you and other Times leaders have stood by while simultaneously praising me in private for my courage. Showing up for work as a centrist at an American newspaper should not require bravery. You're right. Just doing her job should require bravery, but her office and her people should be behind her 100%. That's the whole point of having a business. Part of me wishes I could say that my experience was unique, but the truth is that intellectual curiosity, let alone risk-taking, is now a liability at the times. Why edit something challenging to our readers or write something bold only to go through the numbing process of making it ideologically kosher? when we can assure ourselves of job security and clicks by publishing our 4,000th op-ed arguing that Donald Trump is a unique danger to the country and the world. And so self-censorship has become the norm. That's unfortunate, but it's actually not self-censorship. 
They've made examples of people already that actually causes that kind of thing. But it's backfiring, as you can see. What rules that remain at the times are applied with extreme selectivity. If a person's ideology is in keeping with the new orthodoxy, they and their work remain unscrutinized. Everyone else lives in fear of the digital thunderdome. Online venom is excused so long as it's directed at the proper targets. Op-eds that would have easily been published just two years ago would now get an editor or a writer in serious trouble if not fired. If a piece is perceived as likely to inspire backlash internally or on social media, the editor or writer avoids pitching it. If she feels strongly enough to suggest it, she is quickly steered to safer ground. And if every now and then she succeeds in getting a piece published that does not explicitly promote progressive causes, it happens only after, a, after every line is carefully massaged, negotiated, and caveated. That is not freedom of speech, nor is it the freedom of press. First Amendment, the, the very people who are dependent on the First Amendment are literally ripping it in half. It took the paper two days and two jobs to say that the Tom Cotton op-ed fell short of our standards. We attached an editor's note on a travel story about Jaffa shortly after it was published because it failed to touch on important aspects of Jaffa's makeup and its history. But there is still none appended to Cheryl Strayford's, oh, I'm sorry, Cheryl Strayed's fawning interview with the writer Alice Walker, a proud anti-Semite who believes in lizard Illuminati. That sounds like one I'll have to miss. Maybe I will read it, who, can, who knows? The paper of record is more and more the record of those living in a distant galaxy, one whose concerns are pro profoundly removed from the lives of most people. This is a galaxy in which to choose just a few recent examples. The Soviet space program is lauded for its diversity. The doxing of teenagers in the name of justice is condoned. And the worst case, the worst caste systems in human history includes the United States alongside Nazi Germany. Why they're comparing us to them? Well, you know they are, why they are. They're doing the thing and blaming it on the other side. I see it every day. Even now, I am confident that most people at the times do not hold these views, yet they are cowed by those who do. Why? Perhaps because they believe the ultimate goal is righteous. Perhaps because they believe that they will be granted protection if they nod along as the coin of our realm. Language is degraded in service to an ever-shifting laundry list of right causes. Perhaps because there are millions of unemployed people in this country and they feel lucky to have a job in a contracting industry. Or perhaps it is because they know that nowadays, standing up for principle at the paper does, does not win plaudits. It puts a target on your back. Too wise to post on Slack, they write to me privately about the new McCarthyism that has taken root at the paper of record. Go along to get along. Can't imagine being that f afraid of losing a job. Uh, maybe back in 2008 or maybe now. But I can't imagine being that afraid of losing a job to not stand by your own principles. How do you sleep at night? All this bodes ill, especially for independent-minded young writers and editors paying close attention to what they'll have to do to advance their careers. Rule 1. Speak your mind at your own peril. Rule 2. Never risk commissioning a story that goes against the narrative. Rule 3. Never believe an editor or publisher who urges you to go against the grain. Eventually, the publisher will cave to the mob, the editor will get fired or reassigned, and you'll be hung out to dry. For these young writers and editors, there is one consolation, as places like the Times and other once great journalistic institutions betray their standards and lose sight of their principles. Americans still hunger for news that is accurate, opinions that are vital, and a debate that is sincere. I hear from these people every day. An independent press is not a liberal idea or a progressive idea, or a democratic ideal. It's an American ideal. You said a few years ago I couldn't agree more. America is a great country that deserves a great newspaper. 
None of this means that some of the most talented journalists in the world don't still labor for this newspaper. They do, which is what makes the liberal environment especially heartbreaking. I will be, as ever, a dedicated reader of their work, but I can no longer do the work that you brought me here to do. The work that Adolf Ox described in that famous 1896 statement, to make the columns of the New York Times a forum for the consideration of all questions of public importance, and to that end, to invite intelligent discussion from all shades of opinion. Sounds like he knew the American way, or was at least an advocate of the, t the First Amendment. Ox idea is one of the best I've encountered, and I've always comforted myself with the notion that the best ideas win out. But ideas cannot win on their own. They need a voice. They need a hearing. Above all, they must be backed by people willing to live by them. Sincerely, Barry. So far as I've had time to read over and check out uh, of her newsletter, she is a very accomplished writer. I understand completely what she says in her writing. Uh, and her writing seems thoughtful and well-researched. I mean, even her resignation letter was based upon a quote from the founder of the paper. Classy. Real classy. She knows what she was doing. And it sounds to me like she knew that's she knew why she wanted that job at that particular newspaper, especially since they sound like they might have lied to her and told her, hey, we didn't know about the 2016 election. Why don't you come help us out? And they basically proved to her why they didn't know about the, 20, the 2016 election. It was exactly why. And it's exactly what's going to happen in 2022 and 2024, from what I can tell. They keep coming up with all of this crazy stuff that actually is not realistic whatsoever and protects people that are not lawful. So yes, I believe that 2022 is going to be a landslide for the other side. And if it's not, then we can probably compare it to 2020. How impactful and gut-wrenching, though, was this letter, this, this, this re resignation letter? Uh, I would have thought twice before letting her go because to me, you can learn from everyone and everyone's voice counts. But then again, I'm not a paid stooge for the sponsors either, nor would I ever be. Once again, I admire very much Barry Weiss. I don't give a shit what she thinks about the Bible. I don't give a shit what she thinks about anything else as long as she is a free speaker and she advocates the same. Now. I highly recommend that if you want to go and talk to her, go ahead and, and check out her blog. You can actually register and just watch everything that she, that she says. She'll send it to your uh, mailbox as a newsletter, but if, just of course, just like everyone else, uh, if you want to support her or if you'd like to talk, be able to talk to her or add your um, opinion to her site or whatever it is that she's doing over here, go for it. I have no idea how much it is. I didn't check main thing I did was the research on her to begin with and pretty much the reason why they're trying to cancel her too. I say, become uncancelable. Go Barry Weiss. Free speech for all. I do hope that you enjoyed my video today. Once again, I'm going live coming up December the 2nd, 7 p.m. Central. I'm calling the series Talk to Me America. My call-in talk show will feature you. Call in and tell the universe how you feel about the topics that affect us the most. Let us know what your experience was when things we see happening have happened to you. We cannot be free without the freedom of speech, and I want to be a part of that freedom that we are guaranteed by our Creator. So stay tuned and get your voices ready to speak out. Spread the news and stay tuned for Here's What I Heard's Talk To Me America series, coming up December the 2nd, 7 p.m. Central. In the meantime, please give us a like, a share, a subscribe, and a comment. You will be doing this on my call-in talk show, so start letting me know what you heard now in the comments. The best comments and the best phone calls will be featured in my videos all over the internet. The world wants to hear what you have to say, so call me and tell them like it is. A donation would be the ultimate and will help me get your voice out on as many platforms as possible. And you can follow me on those other platforms, too. All of my links are below. Click on some of them, will ya? Thank you for clicking on my little acre of the internet today. Until next time.